Governor Tim Wall successfully fended off his Republican challenger and secured another four years in office. And now he says he's ready to move forward after a challenging first term. Our Caroline Cummings sat down with Walls, who says he believes with different dynamics at the Capitol, there's a new opportunity to get things done. Okay, Governor, thanks for sitting down with us. Yeah. Uh, the dawn of your second term, how are you feeling now that the pandemic, which largely defined your first, is mostly behind us, we hope? Yeah, well, we've learned it's more endemic as we hope. We still manage it. We, you know, make sure we get good public health information out there, but I'm feeling incredibly optimistic. Um, I don't, you know, obviously winning the election, we're happy with that. We've got some working majorities, but I just think it's moving beyond that, the lessons learned, and now we can start to apply things. Uh, to improve people's lives. And already the legislature is moving bipartisan things like tax conformity, give some relief to families. Uh, that just bodes well, I think, for, for a session that people want to see be relatively normal, finish on time, not a lot of drama, improve lives. What would you say are your top three priorities, kind of big picture? Yeah, and I at the inaugural, I laid it out. It's our goal to make this the best state for families to live. I think we can see some sustainable, robust education funding and innovation around that. Um, I think you're going to see us continue to uh, make sure we're investing in infrastructure development across the uh, across the state. Uh, that includes broadband infrastructure. So I think getting those couple proposals um, around education, around um, transportation funding, and then just some of the things that we know that improve lives, whether it's, uh, it's the housing issues, it, it's dealing with some of the things in the budget that we're hearing from you know businesses and families across the state. If we can stabilize things like housing, if we can stabilize things like childcare, if we can make sure schools are adequately funded to keep property taxes down, I think all of those things, and then providing some, some both immediate and long-term relief to people. I think you can see a tax bill that's gonna be targeted at the middle class, still encouraging the legislature to, to do some direct payments to folks to just ease the pain of inflation right now um, and, and get them ready for the growth that we've already been seeing, make sure it continues. So on any tax bill, do you think rate cuts for lower tier well, rates or social security or both? I think you will see us targeting more. I think things like child tax credit will be in there. I do think there'll be social security relief for folks. Um, we started that in 2019. Minnesota has a pretty good system on this where about half of people are totally exempt from that and then it goes up according to how much you make. I think we move to exempt more people, make sure we bring that down on a lot of families. We're, you know, I think again, I'm not that concerned removing that on folks who are making millions every year in retirement, the richest Minnesotans, they'll do okay. Um, but I do think relief will be there. So I think it'll be a combination of things, mainly targeted at the middle class. Again, encouraging the legislature to think about some immediate tax relief that we can do in the form of rebate checks to them. I do think that that's something that Minnesotans uh, have asked us for. We heard it on the campaign trail. I also think it helps our economy. But last year, the global agreement yeah. was full exemption of social security taxes, tax-free. What has changed and what do you say to Minnesotans who might be expecting that after that deal languished here? Well, if you're one of the richest Minnesotans, I'm, I'm, you're going to get exempted on most of your Social Security if you're making, you know, million dollars or so in retirement. For most Minnesotans, you're going to see tax relief in this. You're going to see it on a lot of fronts in terms of property tax relief. You're going to see it in forms of child care. Um, and what's changed was is we cut a deal and Senate Republicans decided to roll the dice and come back again this year. Um, there's a whole bunch of priorities in there. I am deeply concerned long term on our seniors, but I also think you'll see a comprehensive package around long-term care, around making that more affordable on senior nutrition programs. So um, again, for working you know, Minnesotans and for the vast majority of our seniors, you're gonna see significant rate cuts in that. For those folks who are at the very top expecting a full um, repeal of that, um, I think they'll, they're gonna be okay. Can you, is there a bill you want to see by the end of this month or you expect to see on your desk by the end of this month? Yeah, and I'm really, I want to congratulate uh, Speaker Hortman and Leader Dietzik right now and, and, and bipartisanly on this with their counterparts. It, it sounds like next week we're going to see the tax conformity bill, which was a top priority of Republicans. It was part of that universal deal that was not accepted. That will provide tax relief immediately to get some conformity done. I think that'll be next month. And then I think we heard very clearly um, from Minnesotans, whether it be around protecting the democracy, making sure we protect the rights to vote and democracy and make our elections uh, more open, um, and also the issue of reproductive rights, an, an issue around abortion access and safety. I, I would like to see that by the end of the month. We know that the the anniversary of, uh, of the Roe decision is on the 21st of January, and I think I'm seeing things move on that. So I just think election security, um, the issue around access to abortion, and then 
take care of the real business. That tax conformity bill should have been done over a year ago, but the, the political gridlock stopped that. Um, that's going to be a first indication to Minnesotan that things are different. This is a bipartisan bill that I think will probably get almost universal votes. That's probably going to be the first thing that I sign. You talked about uh, ending gridlock, but your agenda could still face a bumpy road considering it's just a one seat majority yeah. in the Senate. How do you see that? And do you think that there's going to be you know, bringing some Republicans into the fold. Oh, sure, we, we have to. Want. They're going to be involved the whole time. I, what I say is, is that um, that's the way democracy is supposed to be. This is not just about my agenda sailing full. It will be improved upon. It will be compromised on amongst people, but it will be delivered at the end of the day. That was That's what broke down. That was totally unacceptable. It's the biggest frustration I've had, I think, as an elected official, that we had a bipartisan deal that was compromises made and agreed upon and simply chose not to do it for political reasons. We have to make sure that's not happening. So I'm fully prepared to compromise. I am fully expect that there will be parts of my uh, agenda that will not be agreed upon totally. And I fully think, as we saw last year, for example, the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund, there was tight alignment between myself and the Republicans on that, and the Democrats were able to come along and reach compromise. So I think we're in a place where I ask Minnesotans to, uh, to give it a chance here. They should expect to see significant tax relief. They should see expect to see significant investments in education. They should expect to see us tackle issues like climate change and, and reproductive rights. And they should expect us to finish on time, gavel out of here, and let them go on with their lives. That's my, that's what I think this session runs. Public safety was a big issue Huge. along the campaign trail. Do you intend to revive your proposal yes. to give local aid to communities for public safety? Yes, the full amount. I know that Senate Republicans did not want to give as much as I did. Yes, I am. That's my, there's a a leading tidbit on what's going to come out in the budget over the next couple of weeks, you're going to see a very robust public uh, safety package, and a lot of it's going to be predicated on the flexibility of those dollars to local communities to make the decisions that's best for them. We're seeing improvements, but zero sum is what it has to be. That'll be coupled with, I think, smart uh, gun legislation to make sure that gun crimes are reduced, um, but you will see a robust budget, and it will still be the framework that we're going to put out from our office is really giving a lot of that flexibility to local communities. You ran on one Minnesota again this term. What do you say to the people who didn't vote for you? That, and I, I heard this as they said, you know, especially in greater Minnesota, my, I respect you on that. Um, and someone asked and I said, not facetious, I said they're going to get exactly what they deserve and that's good roads, good schools, tax fairness, broadband to all corners of the state and a belief that their government works for them and is accountable for their dollars. Um, my job is to deliver for the folks who voted against me with the exact same enthusiasm and work as I do for the folks who voted for me. Um, I think the agenda that we put forward will serve the people of Minnesota well and there's a lot of space in here when I talk about one Minnesota, to live the life that you're choosing to live, to pick communities you're choosing to live in. I just want to make sure you're able to do that. If we have rural communities that don't have access to broadband or a fair enough uh, tax system that they can build new schools, or if we have urban communities that are experiencing too much gun violence, we need to make sure that we're delivering solutions for both of those so that they can live full lives. So, On the tax issue, we, you know, we've, we see, we've seen a budget surplus for several years now. It's kind of become a function of the system. Does that signal to you that it's time for more just rate cuts? Um, I think it certainly means we need to look at that. I don't know on rate cuts necessarily, and I think some of these surpluses may be more one time, but I do think that's the case. I, I don't view these surpluses as meaning because they're there, that means we need to spend more. We need to spend smartly when it makes a difference, but we also need to return it to the people when it makes a difference. I think one of the, the reason that I'm so big on the, the one time payments back to people is, is that it ensures that we get a chance to look at an economy that's still in flux. Uh, we see a very dysfunctional federal government right now. We still do see the war in Ukraine. We still see some inflationary pressures. I think before we make a lot of those long-term major changes, we get a chance to see this thing settle coming out of COVID, but it doesn't mean we don't get the money back to them. So I think those who are worried about this. We, I have not raised taxes as governor, just to be clear. This was not because we did a big tax raise and we collected a bunch more. There were a lot of factors that did it, but I think it's for them to ask if you're continuing to have surpluses and you're finding the smart spending that is moderate and we agree with, with the extra get it back to us. I agree with them on that. But you might have to raise taxes for paid leave though. Well, those, those payroll taxes on things like unemployment insurance, we've certainly left that open. My pledge is, is that this does not hit any of these things, will not hit middle class folks, that will not hit working families. Um, we've talked about the issue of um, we have a tax fairness issue in Minnesota that ranks us near the top. I think we'll take that into consideration and um, we will look at that paid family leave again. If you're an employer, you're at the top, you're probably, you know, you're making money. 
if your employees are safe and secure, we know we need to try and do all we can to attract people to work here. One of the things we see that states have a better opportunity to do that is where they offer paid family and medical leave. So that's a long-term investment, just like unemployment insurance. Last question. I, I know you guys are quick on yeah. time here, but um, you know it's two year the two-year anniversary of the January 6th Capitol attack. Yeah. My first few days on the job, there was a lot of press conferences about how are elected officials safe? How is this Capitol building safe? How are the seats of government safe? Yeah. Do you think the Capitol is safe? And is there anything that you would like to see in terms of security for the people who work in this building? Well, I think our, of that? Yeah, I think our law enforcement, especially state patrol that's, that's tasked to do this, does an incredible job. Um, I, I think the, the rhetoric that put folks at risk, the folks that stood out in front of this Capitol two years ago talking about casualties at my house with my family. Um, we need to continue to focus on that, but I feel very comfortable with the folks here are doing it. I will say this, I think when people come here to express their opinion, you've seen across the board some of the issues I agree with, some I don't. You see them come to the rotunda, they have rallies and things like that. This is not a place where we need firearms in here, and I think this is one that I would say and I would hope the the legislature may take up on this. This doesn't need to have firearms, or you can come and express your opinions with your voice without intimidating others. And our Capitol Police do an incredible job of keeping safe. I feel very comfortable with them. Um, I'm not so sure you have big rallies with a lot of heated rhetoric that you need a lot of firearms in this building. Metal detectors, maybe? Um, I'll let the experts decide on that. Um, but I, I think the closer we can put people to the idea that I walk through the hall and somebody's able to just say, hey, Governor, I wish you'd do this. That's a really good thing. And I just want to make accessibility, balance it with that. That's where I listen to my experts. Keep watching CBS News Minnesota for continuing coverage.